This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Battle of the budgets. First up, House Republicans say their plan saves nearly $5 trillion. The White House says the math doesn't add up. Another record, barely the Dow inches higher to another all-time high, but the S&P 500 snaps a seven-day winning streak. And the unfriendly skies, how frequent flyer programs are changing. Fasten your seatbelts, make sure you're locked in and upright for this news. Good evening and welcome to our public television viewers. Susie, uh, after days of having the focus on Wall Street, today it shifts to Washington. It sure did, Tyler. There's an escalating budget battle waging in the nation's capital after House Republicans unveiled their latest federal budget proposal today with plans to slash the country's massive deficit and get government spending under control, all without raising taxes. As Senate Democrats prepare their own budget plan, can Congress and the president reach a bipartisan budget compromise any Anytime soon. Hampton Pearson takes a look. House Republicans unveiled a blueprint they say balances the federal budget in the next decade with just spending cuts and no new tax hikes. At the top of the GOP list of what's needed to achieve $4.6 trillion in spending cuts over the next decade is to repeal Obamacare, cut domestic programs from Medicaid to college grants, and require future Medicare patients to bear more of the program's cost. GOP budget point man Paul Ryan once again throwing down the gauntlet to Democrats. We don't think it's fair to let critical programs like Medicare go bankrupt. We don't think that it's fair to take more from hardworking families to spend more in Washington. The Obama White House wasted little time criticizing the House Republican budget, saying when it comes to reducing the deficit, the math doesn't add up and the middle class will pay the price. This is the alternative to balance. It, it, it results in uh, unfair tax hikes on middle class Americans and it results in an undue burden on middle class Americans. This afternoon, the president met with senators from his own party just as details of the Senate Democrats' budget plan surfaced. That plan will call for $1.85 trillion in deficit reduction, evenly split between tax increases from closing loopholes and spending cuts. The White House says the contrasting budget plans and the president's blueprint, which will be released in early April with negotiations to follow, are a return to what Washington calls regular order. While both budget plans are dead on arrival in their opposing houses, tomorrow President Obama will return here to Capitol Hill to meet with House Republicans in what the White House calls an effort to engage lawmakers in the budget process. It's also being dubbed his charm offensive. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. As Hampton pointed out, health care costs were a big focus in that House proposal. So coming up, we'll talk to former Vermont Governor Howard Dean and journalist Stephen Brill about controlling costs. On Wall Street today, the Dow's winning streak extended to an eighth session in a row. A last-minute push by investors sent the blue-chip average up nearly three points, closing at 14,450. That's another all-time high. The Nasdaq lost 10 points, the S&P down almost four points, ending seven straight days of gains. BlackBerry was the most heavily traded company on the Nasdaq today. More than 80 million shares changed hands well above the average daily volume there. Shares were off nearly 3 percent, this on a day when pre-orders for the company's new Z10 smartphone began. Some are looking at this product as a potential make-or-break item for that smartphone pioneer. John Ford explains. The BlackBerry. It used to be shorthand for coolest phone in the world. Wall Street types were obsessed with them, government workers too. Less than four years ago, Fortune named it the fastest growing company. Now BlackBerry's on the ropes with its hopes pinned on this phone, the Z10, which customers can pre-order online today and come pick up in one of these AT&T stores on March 22nd. The new iPhone, 3G. What happened? Mainly the iPhone. When it came out six years ago, the iPhone started small. Unlike the BlackBerry and every other smartphone, it had a big touchscreen and one button in front. Now the iPhone is the best-selling model in the country, and every other popular phone looks a lot more like this than like this. The names to beat in today's phone game are Apple and Google, who together took more than 90% of the global smartphone market last holiday season. BlackBerry managed just over 3%. The company hopes the Z10 gets it back in the game, but there are bigger challenges. The new phones won't bring in the same highly profitable services revenue investors have come to expect. 
And it's not yet clear whether BlackBerry will be able to sell new phones fast enough to make up the ground its old phones are losing. We don't deny that internationally this has been a very successful device. Sold out Mideast, sold out in Asia, doing very, very well in Europe, uh, surprising a lot of critics. We don't expect the same response here in the U.S., but overall a better than expected launch. Have you ever had a BlackBerry? No. <laughs> Have you ever thought you were going to get a BlackBerry? No. <laughs> Why not? Who do you think a BlackBerry is for? Um, I, nothing negative. I just, I, just went, I just wanted something unique. BlackBerry hopes that's what this phone will deliver with its corporate-friendly security features and new software for sharing photos, videos, and apps. By next month, T-Mobile and Verizon will be offering the Z10 II, and then we'll see whether BlackBerry can really regain its cool. For Nightly Business Report, I'm John Fort. A research group said shipments of Apple iPads will fall behind the growing variety of tablets running Google's Android platform for the first time this year. As smaller size devices catch on, iPads are expected to account for 46% of the pad market, while devices running Android are expected to grow their share to 49%. Apple shares down more than 2% again today. Big box retailers are at the top of tonight's market focus. Walmart's chief financial officer saying it hasn't seen any drop in spending related to the payroll tax increase, though higher taxes are showing up as a concern in com customer surveys. Shares rose fractionally today, but are up about 8 percent year to date. Strong earnings from Costco today, up 39 percent, and that's thanks to an increase in quarterly profit, helped by increasing sales and higher membership fees, and gained market share during the quarter. Shares were rose more than 1% to more than $103 a share. Two Dow component pharma stocks heading in opposite directions today. Merck got the okay to continue a trial assessing the safety and effectiveness of Vitorin. That's its blockbuster cholesterol treatment. Meanwhile, the FDA warned that azithromycin made by Pfizer can cause fatal irregular heart rhythm. Merck gained 3% on the day while Pfizer lost ground. President Obama's nominee to chair the Securities and Exchange Commission says she will be an investor advocate. Mary Jo White, questioned by senators at her confirmation hearing this morning, said that if confirmed, the American public would be her client and that she would not back off if there was any evidence of wrongdoing at major institutions. Assuming you found wrongdoing, uh, I think you proceed uh, quite vigorously against uh, well, frankly, anyone that you find evidence of wrongdoing on, but, but, uh, but certainly financial institutions. At the SEC, which, of course, doesn't have the criminal powers, uh, the, those collateral consequences are not taken into account uh, before charging decisions are made. So that at the SEC, uh, there's no institution too big to charge. White is expected to get the okay for that SEC job, especially after Republican Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma announced today that he would, quote, aggressively support her nomination. Well, there's not a lot of support, by contrast, for the folks at tax prep service H&R Block today after a software snag has delayed the returns for a lot of Americans who have already filed their 2012 uh, taxes. Sharon Epperson joins us now with more. What went wrong here, Sharon? Well, there are a lot of folks that are going to be very disappointed here that they're not going to get their tax refunds as quickly as they had anticipated. What H&R Block is telling us is that between February 14th and February 22nd, a number of filers that were applying for certain education tax credits were, in fact, unable to do so because of the way that they answered certain yes and no questions on the form. These are folks that were claiming the American Opportunity Lifetime Learning Credits, and about 10 percent of the total returns claiming these credits were impacted, according to the IRS. Now, H&R Block tells us this afternoon that any problems that occurred with the form, the Form 8863, have been fixed, and their clients have no immediate action to take. And if they want to find out when they can get their refund, they can do so at Where's My Refund on IRS.gov. But now the IRS says that typically the review process for a situation like this can take up to eight weeks, and this means that they may need as much as four to six weeks to, in order to process the refund. That's, so a lot of folks are going to be that's waiting terrible quite a That's news, because a lot of people count on these refunds, especially students, to pay their bills. I mean, they're waiting for that they're refund check. They're waiting for check. it to pay their bills, and a lot of students and potential students who are trying to get financial aid are also waiting to apply for financial aid till they get those returns done. And so now that is causing problems for them, too. They should actually just still go ahead and apply mm -hmm. for that financial aid. Sharon Epperson, thank you very much. Thank you. And meanwhile, coming up, uh, how airlines are making it harder for you to cash in on those frequent flyer miles. We'll tell you what you need to know. Now let's take a look at how the markets around the globe closed this day.
It's report card time for the nation's 16 largest airlines. The regulators say average on-time arrivals during January fell slightly, and there were more complaints about mishandled luggage. But on the bright side, there were fewer canceled flights and only five reports of tarmac delays that lasted more than three hours. High marks went to Virgin American and Amer uh, Hawaiian Airlines, rather, but regional carriers like Frontier, Express Jet and Pinnacle Airlines were often at the bottom of the list. Meanwhile, if you're the kind of traveler who racks up airline frequent flyer miles, uh, not so far. Uh, some big changes are coming, and they may make the perks that you get a lot less frequent when you fly. Phil LeBeau has more. For frequent flyers, change is in the air. It's quickly taking more flights and more money to achieve higher status with certain airlines. And increasingly, cashing in your miles for an upgrade or a free ticket is becoming tougher. Gone will be the days when you're measured by how many miles you fly. Hello to the days when you're measured by how much money you spend. Right now, Virgin America, JetBlue and Southwest award frequent flyer miles based on how much you spend on a ticket, not how far you fly. It's a move Delta will also be making next year. So Delta frequent flyers who currently achieve different levels of status after flying just 25,000 miles will eventually need to not only fly that far, but also spend at least $2,500 with the airline. To reach the highest level of loyalty, diamond status, you'll need to fly 125,000 miles and spend at least $12,500 in a year. Now you can't uh, earn elite status based on miles flown on cheaper tickets. It's going to take more expensive tickets to earn the higher levels required for elite status. Why are airlines making it tougher to become an elite flyer or to cash in your miles? Blame it on carriers having fewer seats and a growing number of frequent flyers. You're competing for benefits not with just other frequent flyers, but with frequent buyers. And that makes it really, really difficult for anybody to be called an airline's best customer. Meanwhile, as airlines cut their capacity by eliminating flights or using smaller regional jets, there are fewer seats open for award redemption. Remember, airlines are trying to maximize profits from every seat on every flight. So getting an upgrade or a free ticket with your miles or status will be tougher. For the average person, even though they've been trying to save up miles for the low redemption awards, they'll probably have to plan on saving enough to redeem at the medium or even the higher level of redemption rewards. With frequent flyers holding more than 9.7 trillion unused miles, there are plenty of people with plenty of miles. In fact, it's estimated 307,000 frequent flyers have at least 1 million miles in their account. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Fly in those friendly skies. Well, earlier in the program, we reported on Congressman Paul Ryan's GOP budget proposal, which takes sharp aim at health care spending. Journalist Stephen Brill spent seven months putting U.S. hospital bills under the microscope to find out why health care, American style, costs so much. His findings are in the March 4th issue of Time magazine. Former Vermont Governor Howard Dean is a physician who, during his six terms in office, expanded his state's universal health care program and kept costs in check. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, I look forward to uh, this conversation. Uh, Steve, you. you spent 21,000 words, longest article in Time's history. It was an amazing piece with some amazing reporting in it. But I ha I'm going to ask you to boil those 21,000 words down to about 20 and tell me why you think, principally, American health care costs as much as it does. I think I can boil it down into four words. The price is too high, and the reason the prices are too high is that there isn't a free marketplace. The typical health care consumer, whether it's a person who's uninsured or even uh, uh, the uh, largest of the insurance companies, doesn't have the leverage in the marketplace. We live in a world where, you know, we think this is a free market. We like everything to be a free market in this country, but there is no free market when you go to the emergency room. There is no free market when you have to buy um, a cancer drug, and I'm sure uh, that Governor Dean uh, will testify to that from his experience. Governor Dean, let me ask you that question in a different sort of way. In so many industries, we see that costs trend down over time. We've certainly seen it in technology, where the price that we used to pay for a flat screen TV or for a cell phone, those prices are a fraction of what they used to be. But not so in healthcare. Why is healthcare different? In medicine, uh, the more a facility you have to deliver, the more it has to be filled, and therefore the higher the price goes. 
The, the problem is that the fee-for-service system that we have encourages us to spend as much as we possibly can. We, we, we only get paid, we, I'm a physician, get paid when somebody's sick. We don't get paid to keep them well. And in order to fix this problem, you've got to completely do away with the current way of we pay providers and pay them by the patient, not by the procedure. And until that happens, it really doesn't matter what kind of supposed health care cost control you have, it's not going to work. You know, Mr. Brill, I'd like you to pick up on what uh, the governor sure. just said, but but also address uh, one of the things that I found fascinating in your article. Uh, you know, a lot of the political conversation lately has been about raising the eligibility age for Medicare. You argue conversely that if we really wanted to reduce overall costs, though not the part the government pays, you would lower the uh, eligibility age for Medicare. Explain why and what the effect you think would be. Well, it actually reduced the cost that the government's going to pay under Obamacare, too. The reason is simple. The only efficient buyer of health care is uh, Medicare. And if you moved more people into Medicare and away from either not having insurance or using uh, the insurance companies that they have, um, they would be paying a premium to Medicare that would be much less because Medicare's costs are a fraction of what everyone else is forced to pay, the reason being uh, that Medicare alone has uh, the market leverage to buy health care at a reasonable price. So it's not really a matter of moving people away from uh, the fee for service. It's a matter of controlling uh, the prices. And the way you do that is either you have a balanced market, which we don't have, or you have to intervene in some way in that market. You know, uh, Governor, Stephen keeps talking about market forces here, so let's talk a little bit about the market and the role that consumers, the American people, can play in all of this. Do you see that the healthcare industry is going to bring the consumer along, or are consumers going to be pushing for the changes, whether it's on price or any other innovation? Well, first of all, I don't agree uh, with Steve about the putting people in Medicare. I do think it's a good idea to put people at a lower age into Medicare because it is true that they are a lower cost provider and they're more efficient. The problem is their costs are out of control too. So again, you cannot if you as long as you pay us to do procedures, we're going to do a lot of procedures, and that is the fundamental problem. So I, I think it's great if you put people over over 55 into Medicare instead of 65. It's cheaper for the insurance companies. The government pays 4 percent instead of 20 percent uh, overhead, but that is not going to be the ultimate solution. The ultimate solution is get away from fee-for-service medicine. It does not work because you simply pay us to do as much as we possibly can. And as long as you have a system that does that, it doesn't matter what kind of consumer pressure is on it. You want consumer pressure, they can buy insurance well, they can't buy health care well. Well, but the fact is, though, you're talking about one aspect, what the doctors do. If you talk about the cost of drugs, the, toss, uh, the cost of uh, durable medical equipment, the cost of so many other things, just the stay in the hospital room, you really have to get away from a situation where it's a seller's market and a seller's market only. <coughs> so I think That's you have to do both, but I think you have to start by looking at the prices, which is what I did with this article. The simple fact is that we live in two economies in this country. All of us live in one economy, which has had a lot of trouble over the last half decade. And then there's uh, the medical economy, which has been booming, just going hog wild booming. And the reason is there is no control on the profits and the prices. And I don't come at that, you know, from, you know, I'm a left wing uh, perspective mm -hmm. or anything else. I just look at it from the standpoint of the consumer, which is they have no leverage in that marketplace. See, the act actually, what will happen is, under Obamacare, there's actually some hope for this, because the accountable care organizations are going to be big enough to deliver health care at a unit price. I think the hospitals and the physicians all have to be paid by the patient. And if you don't do that, costs continue to go up. All right, gentlemen, we alas have to leave it there. I'm not sure we solved it, but we made a valiant effort. I highly recommend uh, Steve Brill's piece. Uh, it is one of the best things I've read on uh, the health care cost spiral in this country in years. Thanks, Thank uh, Court TV founder Thank uh, and journalist Steve Brill and former Governor Howard Dean. And coming up, Catholics around the world waiting for a new pope. Why it would be beneficial for him to be a man of God with a head for business. But first, let's take a look at how treasuries, currencies, and commodities fare today.
On our radar for tomorrow, we'll learn how retailers coped in February, given higher gas prices and higher taxes, eating into consumers' wallets and the weather. The Business Roundtable releases its CEO survey of expectations for the economy. And we'll get a report from Speaker Boehner about the president's lunch date with House Republicans. Looking forward to that one. All right. The market for high-end art forgeries is a $5 billion a year illegal business with that kind of money at stake. A recent crackdown on selling phony works of art has come up with some surprising results. Scott Cohn has more on the art of the steel. But the Bible tells us to be gracious in our speech. What is a Miami pastor with his deserve. own YouTube channel doing in a Manhattan courthouse charged with attempted grand larceny for trying to pass off half a million dollars in counterfeit art? Well, how does a pastor get into the art selling business? 45-year-old Kevin Sutherland wouldn't say, and his lawyer says there's a logical explanation. The truth will come out, and we really we are very confident in our position. Sutherland pleaded not guilty to charges he tried to pass off these paintings by British artist Damien Hirst to Sotheby's in New York, even though he knew they were fake. Sutherland closed the deal at this hotel, not knowing the person across the table was an undercover New York City detective. Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance, who prosecuted art fraud cases as a young assistant, is cracking down. The same art's being stolen, I think, the same way as it has been stolen for generations. Um, now our tools uh, to build cases are a little more sophisticated than they were 30 and 40 years ago. Robert Whitman, who founded the FBI's art crime team and now works for private collectors, says even with modern technology, these cases are tougher than they seem. You have to prove knowledge that the person knew this material was fake and that he meant for it to be sold and he was trying to basically pull the wool over somebody's eyes. These are some of the Damien Hirst paintings that Sutherland allegedly tried to pass off, even after prosecutors say Sotheby's specifically told him in an email that one of these spin paintings was not authentic. Sutherland allegedly told investigators he didn't really read the email. He's due back in court next month. I'm Scott Cohn for the Nightly Business Report. And one of, if not the greatest, art collections belongs to the Vatican. Today, amidst magnificent frescoes done centuries ago by Michelangelo, the Cardinals cast their first ballot for a new pontiff. But with black smoke from the Sistine Chapel, it signaled no pope was selected. Earlier today, the Cardinals filed into the chapel singing for the saints to help them make their decision. There can be as many as four votes in a day. When one cardinal receives two-thirds of the vote, Tyler, he becomes the new pope. And you know what's interesting? about all of this. It's not just like they're looking for a spiritual leader. This is almost like a CEO search. And, um, you know, the Vatican has this vast empire, and it has a lot of the same issues as any other vast empire. Financial transparency, budget issues, deficits, all those things we talk about They've all the time. They've got real estate. Billions and billions served as customers uh, every week around the country. It's really a, an economy unto itself, I think, if you looked at it that way. In fact, we got some uh, little factlets here uh, that will point out uh, just what we're talking about there. Seven and a half billion in assets at the Vatican Bank alone, 33,000 accounts in 100 countries. Doesn't rank among the largest banks in the world, but it certainly has a global sweep, as does the Catholic Church. They also have a mini Church. hedge fund, a mini hedge fund that is very conservatively invested, which means that they might have missed out on some of these stock market rallies. I, I suspect maybe they have. Well, that's it for us, Nightly Business Report for tonight. And we want to remind you that this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support, support that makes Nightly Business Report possible. Absolutely it does. And on behalf of your public television station, station. Thank you for your support. Good night, everyone. We hope to see you right back here tomorrow night.
I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. The Dow's record breaking winning streak extended to an eighth session in a row. A last minute push by investors sent the blue chip average up nearly three points, closing at 14,450, another all time high. The Nasdaq lost 10 and the S&P down almost four points, ending seven straight days of gains. The Nasdaq was dragged lower by a 2 percent drop in shares of Apple after a report predicted a sharp drop in market share for its iPad tablet computer. House Republicans unveil their latest budget proposal today with plans to repeal Obamacare and cut spending on domestic programs like Medicaid by nearly $5 trillion without raising taxes. And tune into Nightly Business Report here on your public television station.